Me. Okay. Hi, my name is Clark Johnson. I'm a grad student studying advertising. I also have a degree in marketing. Um, uh, should I say anything I'm working on? Or? Yeah, yes. okay. share a little bit what you're working on. So I'm currently working on two different projects. One is an app to try and make waking up in the morning a little bit easier, as well as making you feel a little bit more confident with what you're wearing. I'm really excited to launch it. That's hopefully coming out by the end of this semester. And then I'm also making a fashion media series, which is kind of aiming to challenge how people view fashion. So you might not think you necessarily interact with the fashion industry because you might not think you're super stylish. You might not think you're fashion conscious. When in reality, every day when you choose an outfit, it's subconsciously driven by the fashion industry. You might not realize it, but it's true. So I want people to kind of redefine where they think their place is in the industry and kind of challenge those norms and take more risks with their style. Awesome. Thanks. Do you like my outfit? I love your outfit. Okay, that matters. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, my name is Kelsey Davis. I'm the founder and CEO of Collective. Uh, Collective is a portfolio platform that connects creators to paid opportunities. Uh, I like to say, if uh, anybody know Tinder, raise your hand. Don't be shy. Tinder, yeah, we all out there. You know, I used to be out there. Uh, so basically, we say if Tinder and LinkedIn had a baby, but for the creator economy, that's basically how our platform operates. Um, and so we've created the fastest, easiest way to create a portfolio. Um, and so from that portfolio, we're then able to create matches and recommendations for different job opportunities that you should be matching with. Um, in a very Tinder-like way, you could then swipe uh, to meet and match with different brand opportunities and brands can then easily view your portfolio. It speeds up the, the screening, recruiting, talent acquisition process. And so we're basically you know, solving for creative staffing uh, in this new world, uh, which uh, you know, I could talk a lot about. So uh, throughout that journey, I've done you know, tech stars. I graduated um, from Whitman uh, in grad school and then went out to LA to do tech stars along the way. I got Forbes 30 to 30 and a lot of other cool stuff. So excited to be back just to share. Hi guys, I'm uh, Nick Muscatello. I'm a junior here. I'm a TRF major. Um, a little bit of what I do is I started up a visual production company called Project Freefall. Um, what we do is we partner with music artists and we help build them up through uh, TikTok content, Instagram Reels content, and music videos. We even um, are launching our first short film next week. Super excited about that. Um, and what we kind of found out is that a lot of rising artists don't have the budgets to afford big scale uh, media campaigns. So what we kind of came up with was in exchange for our services, having them perform at our live concerts, which we're having our first one this Saturday, super excited about. Um, and basically we take the proceeds from those concerts to fund their media campaigns. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. Obviously, uh, one of my favorite things about this panel is that every single panelist is in a different part of their journey, both as a student, but also as an entrepreneur. And given that, I'd like to ask, what inspired you to start um, on this journey? What was the catalyst? I would say for me, I've always been very entrepreneurial. Ever since high school, I had a folder of different business ideas and I thought going to business school would be the perfect way to get started and I'd be so excited and you know I'd be in there and I'd pitch all these ideas to my professors and they'd be like that's great and then I got to business school and it was like your idea sucks and it wasn't only just that it was kind of like here are all the reasons why it sucks here are the financial issues the accounting issues it kind of felt as if it stifled any creativity I had and it almost instilled a fear in me to fail. And I think that that is still something that I'm trying to overcome. But I think switching in a new house kind of gave me this confidence to start pursuing opportunities because it's the perfect mix of, inno I'll say being innovative and creative. And that's what I need to actually start pursuing what I needed um, to make. And then I also ended up talking to Kelsey back in March right before I decided to commit to grad school and something she told me is don't be afraid to fail. That's like the one thing you can't do. So I think that's where I'm at right now and that's why I'm pursuing this. Lit. Um, <laughs> I'm like, yay. Because uh, failure is inevitable. Like, you're going to fail. Like, and what's failure? You decide that. Um, yeah, so I got started uh, basically by my sophomore year. I was a television, radio, and film student. By the end of my sophomore year, I was skipping Schoolmaker's classes um, and Sean Brannigan's classes. Yes. 
Uh, and traveling around the world producing content with my favorite artists and brands like ASAP Rocky, Lil Yachty, uh, Coca-Cola, Land Rover, Puma, Kanye Nast. Um, and along that way, I just saw a lot of issues, one, with being on track to graduate. And then uh, two, uh, in that process, basically, I saw a lot of issues with how creators and brands can connect, like literally. So a lot of the opportunities I was getting, I literally like get phone calls from producers uh, you know, who maybe just have my information from previous call sheets or different, you know, projects that I worked on. And I'm literally, like, standing outside of, like, New House 2, like, talking to a producer, and they're like, hey, can you be in L.A., like, in three days? And I'm like, for sure. Like, I have nothing to do. Uh, and so I eventually got to a point where it was like, all right, like, you know, I have to figure out a way that I can still graduate. I was a policy scholar. I really cared about, you know, education. Um, m less so in the academia type of way, and more so I understood the value of being, uh, in this type of environment and just having access to these types of resources even outside of the classroom but just still in this type of new house environment and so um, I basically started building a collective of creative peers around me who were in different classes that I had or different students from U Albany, Cornell, U Buff, RIT especially they're lit uh, and I was like, yo, like, I can't do this project, but hey, I have this student in Rochester who's really good who probably can make that happen or et cetera. So then I found myself basically trying to aggregate their data to be able to send it off to a brand. And that looked very complicated. So I would say, hey, Clark, you're interested in this opportunity. Are you interested in uh, or like send me your portfolio? So then they'd maybe send me YouTube videos. TikTok wasn't a thing at the time, but they'd send like Instagram videos, maybe some stuff they submitted in Blackboard, some stuff they have in Google Drive, and then I would have to kind of curate that and get that off to the brand so that the brand could be like, okay, yeah, I see their stuff, like they're valid, like let's go. And so then I started learning about like product and technology because I was minoring in the iSchool. And I was like, whoa, we need to build a software company. Um, there's not at all an easy way for creators to communicate who they are and what they do. For example, who in this room has a portfolio? I'm gonna take some time for a second. Who has a portfolio? Raise your hand higher. Come on, it's a big room. All right, um, let's just go by. Like, how, what, wh what platform do you build your portfolio on? Just scream. Just shout out. Squarespace, Wix, Wix. GitHub. GitHub. That's an interesting one. <laughs> No, the reason why I say that, so like um, Squarespace Wix, you're paying at least, let's say, $150 annually in order to host that domain. You need to then buy the domain itself, and then you're paying for that service cost. You then have to say, what's my brand? And like identify, OK, what's going to be the aesthetic for my portfolio? You then have to link all of your different content, figure out the copy that you're going to have for that. Um, and then every single time you do a project, you have to update all of that, right? That process in itself of creating the website might be a 30-day process. And then every time you're, you're having to go update your website, that may be a one day to one week process. Um, and really just the, that's just a lot um, for somebody who should be focused on creating. Um, and so what we were thinking is like, what if there was like a GitHub repository type of environment? With GitHub, you can basically, Anything that you're coding on, you can basically, like it's like an open source way to like see your work and see your projects, but there's not something like that for creators. Um, I have to always go back to Wix and re-update you know, my website and all that. And so we were like, what if we created a portfolio that operated almost like this hinge or this Tinder, you could easily just have this profile, see your skills, your interests, all that. Um, and so that gave me something to actually be like a researcher around. And that's really what I spent my time in school on. So between you know, the, the, the Digital Media Center, the Launchpad, and then getting my Master of Entrepreneurship in Whitman, that became my focus point. And so at that point, I'm talking to all students trying to do like customer research, like, hey, like, you know, what are your career goals? Like, what are you trying to do? And I realized, you know, no knock to career services in Newhouse, they're great. But at the time, like, and still I probably, they can't really source opportunities of like, oh, there's this random freelance photography gig, or oh, there are these you know, types of jobs that I was actually trying to go get my hands on. And so that's why we created Collective. It was really just, I was somebody who was experiencing the problem as a student, um, and I just wanted to be able to create a solution that created a more scalable experience for people who were like me. And so now we're able to connect you know, students like you guys to companies like Chime, you know, DoorDash, Techstars is a customer now. Um, and so it's just kind of a future of work way to drive staffing and recruiting. And, yeah, for me, it just came out of the problem of not really being able to have that solution for myself as a student. Definitely, love that. What about you, Nick? Yeah, so I kind of got started, well, I, I was always kind of trying to create something. Uh, in high school, I was making videos just with my friends, and then when I got uh, here at New House, I tried making like videos for the sports teams. I just, I just tried creating whatever I had the opportunity to create. Um, and then I had the idea for Project Freefall, and what was interesting about it is it was nothing 
to what it is now, like the initial idea. The initial idea was I'm going to make commercial videos for companies that, um, that need better brand, like brand building. And I did that for like two months and I realized I hated it. I was like, this is the most like boring work I've ever done. And I had a, a friend here that was uh, a music artist. Um, his name is St. Luke. And I just was so inspired every time I listened to his music of just like ideas for videos, ideas for videos. And I was like, why am I not doing that? Um, so then I just switched the model to focus more on music artists and had so much fun with it. And literally like fell in love with it and I knew it was like right and so I just kept going with it. Um, one thing that I think is like interesting about that though is like as you're like thinking about what you want to do, be open to change and like expect that like it's whatever you're thinking like it's gonna evolve into something else and it's still like what we're doing right now is still evolving. Like every every week or so Project Freefall like we, we slightly tweak our methods and we, we do something new. Amazing, and you've all touched on the fact that you've been able to leverage the community around you um, to be able to develop this. What have you found are your best resources when it comes to being at Syracuse University or Kelsey during your time here to help build out your vision, right, as that shifted and changed? I used to like hang out outside of board meetings and stuff like that. Um, For clubs? Yeah, no, like of the oh. university or like of Newhouse. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to like, uh, yeah, like try to get information from like a Scooney. I'm just gonna keep referencing you this whole time. Be like, uh, hey, uh, there's kind of something important on campus. Like, what are they doing right now? It's like, oh, like a board meeting at 3.30 at this office? All right, pay, like, I'm just chill. And uh, I would just like, I would just, you know, try to take the things that maybe aren't the overt things that are like people are just throwing to you, mm -hmm. such as like join this club, which I did, I'm an AK Psy. Um, shout out to AK Psy. Like, uh, and I was an orientation leader. I loved that. Um, but for me, it was really about like, how do I get access to the people? Um, and so that was like alumni, board members, faculty, staff, um, even people out in the community. Um, I think there's something, the same thing that attracts me to a new house. I have to imagine that something relatively parallel maybe attracts you to a new house or attracts, you know, Stanley to a new house, whoever he is, or like there has to be something parallel. And so for me, it's like, what's the through line of like, why you care and why I care. And, and, and it may not be all the same things, but I think whatever that through line is allows you to take something like showing up to a professor's office hours and now you're in there for an hour, having a conversation, maybe that started about the curriculum, but, but now that is you know, so much bigger and deeper than that. Um, and just seeing the university as a research institution, research institution, I didn't really value that until I got deep into my entrepreneurial journey because all I'm doing as an individual, still in my day-to-day -day job is research. Like, talking to customers, investors, like seeing the market, trends, looking at companies that fail, IPO, um, and just trying to see, you know, there's the trends, like what's happening in the market. Um, and so I think that Newhouse, specifically in the context of media, is a place where kind of the highest level of, of research in the context of media is happening. Um, and so I wanted to stay close to that. And I think that I, I, I uh, appreciate it more and more, like as I, like get out of new house. Uh, whereas like now in my career, I'll be at, you know, uh, NABJ or uh, these, these random places. And it's like, wow, new house runs the world. Like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> it's real. The stuff they real. tell you is, is real. The new house mafia slash family, depend on yeah. who you speak to, is very, very yeah. real when you I, Yeah, I feel there. like they're trying to stop the mafia language. I know, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's whatever. Uh, <laughs> Why would they do that? <laughs> I see what's looking at me. <laughs> yeah. but I, I will echo what Kelsey was saying. I don't think I appreciated um, I, I mean, I took as much advantage as I, I thought I, I could as an undergrad, but I didn't appreciate the uniqueness of the environment and the community that you have here. I don't think you deeply appreciate it until you're in an environment that's not that, yeah. right? Whether it is you go to another institution or you go to corporate or you work yeah. at a traditional firm or anywhere, you just, it's not the same kind of learning. Well, I'm curious, y'all, you transferred and then you're a yeah. grad student. Yeah, so, talk about so how are y'all? Those transitions. Oh, it's so different. It's <laughs> so, so different having a network that really cares about the students and I can really feel it. And it's so strange to just know that I can connect with anybody anywhere who was in Newhouse and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Newhouse, yeah, what's up? What do you need? And I'm just like, okay, yeah, if you, if you say so. Um, <laughs> my professor, is, his name is Sean, and he introduced me to this founder. She graduated from Cornell and she came up on Labor Day, and I didn't even expect to meet her, I just happened to talk to her. And after she heard about what I was working on, she was like, we didn't have any of this at Cornell, I didn't have any of this type mm -hmm. of stuff. 
what do you need? How can I help? And I said, I just met you 10 minutes ago. What do you mean? You want to give me money? <laughs> and she was like, yeah, just let me know. What do you need? I, I can just, yeah, what do you need? I didn't ask for anything yet, but, <laughs> but, <I'm> going. <laughs> yeah, but I was just really impressed. And then I also feel as if the advisors here are just so helpful. Wes, do you want to put your hand up real quick? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was during boot camp, which is the six, very intense six weeks uh, that all grad students have to go through here where we are just in class eight hours a day, nonstop, three assignments do a day type of thing. I remember I had a break and Jada, you wanna put your hand up? Hey. Hey. Jada is the one who pretty much convinced me to switch over into Newhouse and she said, okay, if you wanna make things happen, come here, go find Wes. So I went to Wes's office and one of the first things I said to him was, I wanna be a face of Newhouse. That was it. And I bugged him just about every other day since. Every other day. And every other day, he's down to help me. He's always giving me suggestions. He's always directing me to someone to talk to or things to do. He'll give me things to know about before I even go into a meeting with the dean. I have a meeting with the dean next week um, to try and get myself sent to a little festival. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But um, the dean was like, just so you know, we only have these limits. And I said, oh, I know. Wes already told me. Don't worry about it. So it's just so different to have these faculty and alumni so ready to help you out. Um, Kelsey and I were in the same fraternity, so that's partially why I was able to get in contact with her, but she was just so understanding of how to navigate Newhouse and how to use it to your advantage. And because of that, I've been able to understand who to talk to, where to go, what to use, um, maybe what classes to take, and it's been absolutely incredible since. Yeah. What was uh, interesting for me as a transfer student, uh, I transferred from Marist College. I was there uh, for the first semester of my freshman year and it was, it was really weird for me because as I got there uh, as a freshman, I was immediately given all these opportunities to uh, be like the head videographer for their football team and, and a couple other sports teams and it was super exciting at first. I was like, this is great. But then very quickly what I realized was like, I was a big fish in a small mm -hmm. pond. And I was like, why am I getting these opportunities as a freshman that something doesn't seem right? Um, and what I realized pretty quickly was, uh, it, it, I, I wasn't surrounded by people with the same mindset, with the same drive. Um, so I did some research. I talked to my sister who's a Whitman graduate here. And she was like, you gotta go to Newhouse. Um, so I transferred and yeah, instantly coming here, it was so clear, like being surrounded by so many people with the same mindset. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, like you guys talked about meeting Sean, he instantly, I was like, this guy gets it. Like he, he, he completely gets it. Uh, unlike I had some other professors love them, but like, they're just out of touch. I hate to say it. We're like, Sean. Say it, say it, say it. <laughs> Name them. <laughs> No, but, but Sean really gets it, and uh, it was super helpful in like my my in my ability to like learn on how to navigate um, in this space. But something that I, I think helped me more than anything else at Newhouse was the other students here. Um, I knew nobody when I came in, and I just started like shooting DMs to people that were like doing what I was doing. One DM that I shot was to Jamari. I see you here, um, and he was. I just told him I was like, "Yo, like." I don't know you, I know you make cool videos, like let's get lunch, and we got lunch and we talked, and I told him I wanted to make music videos, and he connected me with the first artist that I did a music video with. So it was like just like that, within a couple weeks, I was able to do what I wanted to do, and I think that's super special about you know, us. That's so wonderful, and I'll take a moment, for those of you who are hearing Sean and have never heard of Sean Brannigan, um, he's currently not with us, but he is the director of the Center for- He didn't die. Yeah. No, he didn't yeah, die. <laughs> Good call out. No, instead, he is speaking to over, uh, among his many events this week in Estonia and India, he's speaking to like 250,000 uh, students, um, inspiring them and talking about new media. So he's definitely someone that if you have not met yet, definitely meet, um, find his office. But he's definitely one of those new house professors that understands that media is ever evolving and that the future is being built here. Um, and is fully open to helping you make those connections as well as the Career Development Center. So think about this as two resources where you can connect with alumni or people in your industry that are doing really great things. And I really, I, mm -hmm. I met him my freshman year in COM 117 and I really appreciated just how um, 
he really fostered that environment through the startup garage, which I'm excited to share. We'll have a new home in New House One ne next year. Um, but it, it allow you know, it connects you with people who are in your space. If you want to build something, help connect you with physical resources or people or students, which I think is a unique thing about New House. Everyone who comes to New House and chooses New House has, I think, really well set why they're here. They understand they want to build something, they're passionate about something, and are open to learning new things. And we all know here that media is about the experience that you have. The great thing about the New House degree is you're learning how to do the thing, and then while in the rest of your time you're doing even more things, whether it's internships or building something new or working with fellow students or alumni. So given that, um, let's talk some about some of the milestones in your journey as entrepreneurs. And again, you all are in very different stages, but what was a turning point for you that made you realize that this could be something really real and more than just what some would call maybe a hobby for a college student? Yeah, I, go ahead. Okay, I think I started believing it, which is something I didn't always do before. I think that I would just keep these ideas kind of close to my chest and I would only share them with, you know, a person and as soon as I got a, this sucks, that was it. Now, I think because I've experienced so many of those really harsh feedback sessions, I've gotten to a point where it's kind of just like, okay, I'll tweak my idea, I'll pivot, I'll change it, it doesn't have to die. And so I think that I know that I've started, to I've started to get to a point where I see something forming that I don't think I ever saw before, not just with a project, but with myself. And I'm starting to get excited to fail because it's really just a redirection. I don't think I've ever been excited to fail before in my life, but now I'm thinking about having a failure party or something if it does end up failing. And I think it's gonna be great because it's just a chance to keep going and changing and you know, trying again and again and again because if you never stop, something's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I love that. Um, I would say for me, I think the first, well first we were able to get like $80,000 worth of money before leaving campus just through like pitch compositions and stuff. So I'll say that's the first thing with Syracuse. It's like, it just had a lot of avenues to where I could get early, like non-dilutive capital to then allow me to test these ideas early on. Um, hire some initial engineers, figure out how to build product. Running engineering teams is way different than running creative teams. Um, and so you, you need money kind of to, to fail, honestly, uh, in that type of way. So I had that at first. I think those are my first validation markers. So it's like, okay, amongst my peers, like, all right, this is a really good idea. And then when we got into Techstars, getting into Techstars is like getting into Harvard basically for, or let's say getting in a new house for a media student. Um, and so, yeah, it's like extremely hard program to get into. Um, it's basically the largest startup investor in the world, essentially. Um, and we got into that uh, like when I graduated. And so that was the thing for me. It's like, all right, I need to be able to figure out how I can make money from Collective before graduating in order to do it full time. So we got into Techstars like in March, graduated in May. Um, and then I think the next moment for me was probably Forbes starting on a 30. Um, like I woke up that morning and like before I even like knew, like I was getting like emails and messages from people saying like congrats and I was like, what the heck? Uh, and then like I saw it and I was like, oh shit. <laughs> um, you know, cause that's, it's like, whoa, you know, it's like, whoa. Uh, I was 23 at the time. And I think that for me was like, okay, that was like a, 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 a domestic industry reference point amongst, okay, not just amongst my peers in Newhouse, but like amongst like, other people my age and like below 30, like uh, this is objectively great. Um, and then even like two years later, I think it was this past year, uh, they asked me to come back as a judge for the marketing and advertising category for Forbes 30 and 30. And I was next to like the CMO of McDonald's and like uh, one other person. I think like the CMO of uh, Savage Finty, right? And then like me. Um, and so moments like that are awesome. And then they continue to happen all the time. Like this morning in the airport, like we we're checking in and clear and like somebody was like, I know you, like you were on TV in Tulsa the other day talking about AI and da 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 and I was like, whoa. Uh, so like, it's just little things that happen um, where, you know, it's just like, okay, wow. Like it never, it never does it really feel like, oh yeah, that means we're like winning as much as it's almost like little signals from God that's like, keep going or like, yo, you're on the right track, like just keep going. And then there are other times where it's like, you get signals that often we don't want to listen to, but it's like, all right, it's time to pivot. <laughs> and uh, instead of kind of like accepting that, I think sometimes we try to like will against it 
And it's always harder to swim against the current. I say with entrepreneurship, it's like ride the waves, like allow it, like it just allows you to move, understand that there's markets, things rise, fall. Sometimes it is okay and actually better to kind of ride a tide as you know that it's like going down, like maybe you don't fight it, but prepare, right? And like know that, okay, I'm on this tide, I see where we are, like don't freak out. But it is starts like timing, like the timing of pivoting and knowing, okay, three to six months from now, we gotta make certain other adjustments. But that doesn't mean it's time to do that today. I just feel like something's coming, let me go ahead and prepare so that then when the thing really presents itself, I'm ready to like make that decision. So that's the thing um, I would say. It's like milestones are always great, um, uh, you know, but the, the failures, like they come all the time and they, they come in all different shapes, sizes. Um, so, you know, milestones are awesome. Failures are awesome um, just because it gets you closer to forward is what I say. Yeah, I agree with that so much. I think. Um, well, so first, the, the biggest milestone I think that we achieved, and this happened like literally last week, um, collectively over all of our videos, we've reached over 100 million views. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a super cool milestone, but same thing. It was like, that's cool, but it's like, not to be like, oh, like we've done it, you know? Because it, it's like realistically, like there's so much more that still needs to be done. And there's so many failures that happen to like get to that. The first, uh, the first six months we were making videos, uh, we didn't pass ten. We didn't have a video that passed ten thousand views, and it was um, it was just it, again like to go off what you said, like really believing in what you're creating, what you're doing is super important because we never like stopped believing. It was just like, all right, what do we have to do differently? How can we slightly tweak it? How can we make these little adjustments? And we just kept doing that, doing that, doing that, and then something just clicked, and we kind of figured it out. And then it was just like, all right, now now we know what to build off of. Yeah. It's awesome. And I'll say with milestones too, I think knowing like, milestones are cool, but like knowing like, like we, we have this thing with like KPIs, they're key point indicators, basically in everyone's job, their boss holds them to KPIs. It's like, okay, how do we know that you're actually tracking towards success? And uh, a big thing that you don't wanna do as a business owner is like track vanity metrics. So a vanity metric can mean something like, yo, we have 100,000 followers. It's like, okay, that's great, but what does that mean? Right, like what is the thing actually converting into? So it's like 100,000 followers, does that mean that that's driving certain actions? Does that mean that da da da? So it's like, yo, we got Forbes, that's awesome. How can we actually convert that into something that's meaningful, like an actual thing that could be money, that can mean how are we using that to drive customers? How so I think that's how I try to look at like, all right, what is the value exchange? And I think the milestone is more so just the indicator of like, all right, it's almost like a checkpoint, like mm -hmm. when you're driving or something, it's like, all right, cool, I see where we are. Uh, but it doesn't mean anything unless you have the context to the data and the environment around it. Otherwise, it's just a signal, but you don't know why that signal is contextually relevant. And I think having that context allows you to know how to kind of will more momentum towards that actual higher level vision. Yeah, it's a good example of something that could be a milestone for one person can mean that it's a proof of concept for something or it could just be a vanity metric for another person. So it's not about measuring, you know, comparing yeah. to other people that are in the same field, but looking at what the opportunity yeah. is specifically for what you're building. Um, and given that and shifting a little bit of gears to the landscape in which you're all working, right? You're all involved in the creator space and especially, you know, since you've graduated Kelsey, but also through the pandemic and everything, there's been such a change in media and now even with the strikes, uh, there's a need for new creators and new ways of creating content, not in the traditional way that we've seen it. Um, what are you most excited about this opportunity? What does it bring for either your industry and your businesses or just what the opportunities are for wanting to create something new? Because I haven't fully entered into the space yet, I'm not gonna answer this question and I'm gonna pass it off to you two. <laughs> but but I, what are you excited? What are you seeing? Like what excites you about it? I am definitely gonna say that I'm really excited to see how communities form through social media. I've just noticed that people have kind of congregated around certain topics and I love the way in which they react to certain media and how they uplift people and creators in the space. And it gives people different opportunities to really make their content shine. And I'm really hoping that's what happens with what I'm doing. If it doesn't, it's okay. But I think that that's been my favorite thing that I've been seeing in media so far, um, especially in the creator space. But outside of that, I'm gonna pass it to you. Yeah. I like feeling like I'm not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> like, Scooney will tell you, Sean Brandon will tell you, like, I was like screaming through the halls, like, everything's gonna change very soon. 
<laughs> like we have to have and new classes. <laughs> None of you are thinking about certain things. Like I was just like, guys, like, mm -hmm. uh, and then I remember by the time I graduated, like one of my really good friends, um, you know who I'm talking about, got hired. She was TRF, I'm pretty sure. She was either TRF or BDJ, got hired as like a TikToker at like the Washington Post. Yes. And I'm like, yeah, yes, yes. And like, they were thinking about that though, like in school. Um, but it's like, you know, so I, th I think, you know, looking at that idea of like, you know, media is entrepreneurship. Um, you know, I have parents that have worked in the journalism industry my whole life and before that. And uh, we've always had conversations like around the dinner table. And I'm like, yo, this is not scalable. Like, this is not sustainable. And like, <laughs> as I've seen their large news organization, probably I think the number one news organization, I've seen them go through multiple acquisitions. I've seen their share price appreciate. I've seen them try to do a lot of different things or a lot of different electoral seasons to try to like maintain relevancy. And um, it's just that the, the shifts are changing. I worked at Condé Nast for a little bit. So it's like, I saw them, um, you know, at a time where I think that was like 2017, 18, where it's like, they're like happy that they survived the like print fiasco into digital that they waited forever to like actually do something about. And, but still I felt like they were doing the same thing, but in the context of technology and in the context of like future with creators and, and at the time, and probably it's even worse now at the time, 75% of their workforce was, uh, was freelancers. And so I'm like, man, this is not sustainable. Um, and here we are today. And so, yeah, I think the biggest thing is just like, you know, we have to stay on, it's like, yes, we're new house. We're great. You were awesome. Preeminence, all that stuff. Uh, but it's like, if we want to be able to stay at the pulse, like we have to be technologists, right? We have to be uh, economists. We have to understand the market. We have to understand the technology. Um, and we have to understand that media, media is a medium. Um, and there will always be these channels, but the channels are iterating. Uh, the tools that we're using to create the media are iterating. And so how can we be storytellers? How can we create what's, what I say goes through the eye gates and the ear gates of people, which is film, audio, like whatever. But how are we doing it in a way that meets the consumer and the end user? And that's kind of why I shifted into tech mm -hmm. and to into software because everything in technology is thinking about the end user, we're thinking about product, and thinking about you know agile methodology and more flexible ways of working, and you know how do we create autonomy and all those types of things. Um, and I think in media, I've seen we're we're a lot more about like legacy and like <laughs> all that type of stuff, which which is great as well. Um, but in the context of sustainability, um, you know, you look at the markets, it's like you look at the top 10 companies right now in America, like they're tech companies, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you looked at that though, 10 years ago, a lot of them were media companies. Um, and so now you're looking at a lot of tech companies acquiring media companies and all that type of stuff. So I think what it tells us is that we just have to, as students, as people that are the pre precipice of like, all right, we know that we want to get into the media space, but where do we want to live within that? It's like, well, we want to be the ones that are creating the rules, mm -hmm. that are creating the content, creating the programs, um, creating lanes. And in order to be a creator, I think that you have to be an innovator, right? You have to kind of be entrepreneurially minded, even if that doesn't mean being an entrepreneur. So that's what I would say, looking at all this like creator stuff now, like creator economy wasn't even a word when I was at Newhouse. Imagine that. And I graduated three, four years ago. Yeah. Um, so things are changing fast, and I think they're going to continue to accelerate through things like AI. Um, I call ChatGPT my boyfriend, uh, and it's, it's awesome. So, yeah, we got to figure out how we continue to integrate these things because they're not going away. It's actually just going to keep getting faster. That's what I think. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm super. What I'm excited about, I think, is just like you said, like the creator economy wasn't a word like four years ago, and I think like what a reason for that is because there's so many more people creating nowadays and that gets me excited because when you have more people creating you have more competition it goes back to like the the big fish in a small pond thing that i was saying before now it's like we have a ton of minnows in a big ocean and it's like there's so many people creating there's so much noise that we're all competing for like somebody's somebody's attention and i hope and i'm excited that what's gonna happen is really the best storytellers are gonna rise to the top. The, those are gonna be the real people that are successful in this space in the next couple of years. Um, you start to see it right now on YouTube at least. I'm sure like you guys are familiar with like Mr. Beast and the whole beastification of YouTube and what YouTube has been for the past like two years. And I know a lot of us have, I mean me personally, I haven't enjoyed that. But what's starting to happen now is you see a shift in much more character driven content 
Um, much more like storytelling techniques are being used, and it's interesting that now we're starting to see storytelling as a trend, which is very like weird that like storytelling itself is a trend nowadays. I think so. I'm super excited just for the ne this next generation of storytellers, and I think we're gonna all be like super sharp on storytelling. Yeah, yeah and I think we're. Um what we're seeing really is a decentralization of what media could be, which leaves, you know, can be scary for those of who have been in the industry for a long time or thought that that was their future. But if anything, it's an exciting time to be a part of it because you get to build the world that you want to see, which is what media has always allowed us to do when we're telling stories. But given that, um, for someone who isn't an entrepreneur necessarily, is starting their own thing, how do you think they can leverage things like entrepreneurial thinking when they are approaching their future in the media industry? Yeah, at Collective, we have the statement, we say every human is a creator. I do believe that we all can, like philosophically, I think what makes us human is like, you know, we could look at a problem, we could have ideas, we can talk to each other and be like, hey, what do we want to do about that? Um, and then you can make something happen. Um, and so I think, you know, you don't have to be an entrepreneur in order to be creative. It's like your God-given right and gift, I think, to be creative just as a human being. And so, you know, go into, whether it's into your classroom, into businesses into your internship and be a problem solver, like be a creator in that environment. I think when you're a creator, you're birthing something into the world. Um, and so I was like, hey, like, what did you create today? That could be a conversation that could be, you know, you created a smile for someone, like you created a sense of belonging for somebody, you created uh, a video today, you created, it's just like, what are you doing uh, with these ideas uh, that you have? Um, that's what would be like my advice to like just start tapping into that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, is really just identify who you are as a creator that goes beyond your vocation, but really looking at yourself as a creator in the context of your purpose. Like, uh, irregardless of what you believe, religiously, spiritually, theologically, whatever, it's like, uh, you know, you're here now and you know that you have the power to like do something about that reality. So it's like, what do you want to push into the world? Um, and again, like that could be anything. That could be creating a spreadsheet, creating a video, creating a TikTok, creating a whatever. But it's like, what is the gift that you want to bring to the problems that you're experiencing on a day to day? And I think that is how you can just practice the muscle of being entrepreneurial. And to add on to that, I would say that I didn't realize how much being an entrepreneur centered around just relying on your resources, talking to people specifically. I've spoken to more people than I could even imagine over the past few weeks. And it kind of made me realize that you don't necessarily have to be the most creative person, but if you can rely on those resources to kind of teach you or give you the needs or the assets to build your needs or to leverage anything that you could possibly imagine in order to make something happen, just focus on that. I think that a lot of the time we kind of assume that just because we're not the most creative or we're not the most something, we just kind of stop there. But in reality, if you can use those resources to your advantage, you're doing something. That's entrepreneurship. Okay. Yeah, one thing that we talked about a lot is uh, failure and embracing it. I think that's the biggest thing you could do is just embrace failure. Um, at Project Freefall, one of the things we say is like, whatever you want to do in life, free fall into it. Just go all in. Don't kind of like, oh, maybe I'm going to jump. Go all in. Do it. And it's like, that's really just how you're going to learn no matter what you want to do you're gonna fail and then just embrace it. Cause it's like, that's really how you're just gonna get better that much quicker. Amazing. And um, I know Kelsey, you've had traditional experience before being an entrepreneur, but if you could speak to what are some of the things that you learned from that experience that you took to your own journey? When you say traditional experience, like- Like, like working in an internship or working yeah, in an office. Yeah, yeah. So I, I worked at two, like, two different internships, if you will. I was a PA at Condé Nast, and then uh, I was a like, creative intern at this like, agency under uh, WPP. And the first one, it, I learned, like, oh, y'all are not innovating here. Specifically, the agency that I was at, like, <laughs> their accounts, they had like Home Depot, Ford, and the US Marines. And uh, it was just very like, it just seemed like everyone was just trying to kind of keep their job, like just do the thing. Um, and I also just didn't think that the model of like, okay, brand is paying this like huge agency on a retainer to like say, hey, here's a problem that we're trying to solve. Agencies like coming up with ideas, pitching it, doing everything internally. Like, I don't know, I just, I saw like the org chart, the workflows, everything and like, 
I was just like, this just doesn't feel productive. Like it, it feels productive enough, but it just did not feel scalably productive. But I didn't have enough work experience to understand why or like, um, I didn't know anything about HR. I didn't know anything about like work for real. And so then though, once I started kind of like coming, I would come back to campus, continue like my lifestyles, so like do a little school, do a little travel, like do work on my own. And so then I, I just, I started seeing a lot of different reference points of things. And as a freelancer, I was going into other people's businesses a lot. And so I just got a lot of reference points based on different types of industries. Um, just a lot of different things, like how are people operating? And yeah, I just, I just wanted to do it differently myself. I had two parents that worked for the same job for like over 30 years. Um, I knew I went to great school. I had the luxury and the privilege to be able to like, you know, like, let's mess around and find out, you know? Uh, and so I was just like, hey, let me see. Um, and for my parents, it was really just like, look, if as long as you're making money, you're not really calling us, like, yeah, I don't really care. So uh, fortunately, you know, the pandemic was terrible, uh, but I had time, like it gave me time to continue to sharpen my craft as an entrepreneur. Um, and I love it, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I don't know if I, I think I could see myself for sure, like, you know, after being so collective, I want to get my PhD one day, so do that. You know, I could see myself maybe, you know, hopping into an environment where I'm more like full time, but that would definitely have to look like a crazy opportunity, you know, like a crazy opportunity. Um, so yeah, but I, I like to just go where it feels good, go where I can serve, go where I can be most useful. Um, and I have to kind of straddle the line of sometimes people tell me like, yeah, like you want to have fun, but objectively this is a classroom, <laughs> you know? So like there's just a certain way you have to operate and like straddling the line of like, for sure, okay, let me not be a, a disruption to every, everybody else's learning experience. But at the same time being like, all right, maybe I just need to like skip class real quick then. So I can like go get what I need to like build my type of environment. So um, yeah, I think through life for me, I'm always finding that line of like traditional and like standard. Cause I think there's value in that and the idea of like repeatability, predictability, there's a reason often why things are the way that they are. Often, not all the time, but often. And so being able to submit to that and, be, and humbly receive that and be appreciative of wisdom that came before me to set up these models, while at the same time being like, what can we break? Like, what can we do differently? Um, because I think every generation, like we're just psychologically thinking about things differently. And so yes, to one degree, we need to like, come into the models so that we can operate within the society while at the same time building a new society. Um, yeah, so I'm learning. I love that. Um, I think I also want to get to, tactically for those in the room, getting to learn about um, how to actually leverage. So you've referenced a little bit of that, right? During your new house experience, whether it was working around how many classes you could miss or leveraging things like um, competitions. Mm -hmm. Can you all share at least one you know, piece of tactical advice that you think a uh, new house student should know to be able to leverage and get the most out of their college experience? <laughs> I'm gonna go back to something that I was told by Sean and by Kelsey. Um, uh oh. Yeah. So, someone starting a <laughs> sentence of, I wanna yeah. go back to what I was told Sean by Sean and Kelsey. Is very oh my God. <laughs> it's a good thing, I promise. It's a good thing. So, something that I kinda learned, especially going into Launchpad a lot this year so far, has been if you're gonna talk to somebody about something, make sure you have something to give them, something for them yes. to look at, something that they can give you feedback on. That definitely helped me because previously I was just kind of going to people saying, oh, I have this idea, but you know, I don't really know. Now I can say I have a team, I have money, and now I'm ready to go. Mm -hmm. Can you please tell me what I should do from here, what next steps I should take? Do you have any past experience that could be applicable to this situation? have something to give these people because it makes them not only believe in you further, but it makes them want to connect you with other people as well. And it also kind of makes them understand how to help you. Thousand percent. That, um, yes. She asked me to be her, my, her, my, my, her mentor like within the past year, I told her no. So I was like, I don't know, I don't want to do that. To be just very honest with you. And I'll tell all of you that if you ever say that. Um, and she was like, no, but it won't be hard for you. Like, <laughs> she basically told me no to your no. Uh, I'm just gonna come to you like if you need but basically I was like I, I do like, that a lot um, but like if you do just like don't I don't want to like don't email me and be like hey can I pick your brain like I'm not a freaking weed that you can just like no I don't want to get picked 
Uh, but like, if there's something very specific that mm -hmm. like you're trying to ask, like a very like, I, I would love to talk about specific things. Uh, uh, so yes, and she's been right. great. Yeah, super helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I would say on my end, uh, figure out the actual targets in relation to the goal that you want. So like, I knew once I knew I wanted to do this whole entrepreneurial thing, I knew that my goal was not to have a 4.0. I knew that my goal was not to have a 3.0. My goal was to graduate, and so I needed to talk to a student maker who was in the way of me graduating. I needed to talk to my advisors who's in the way of me graduating. I need to talk to like people, and I think what other people do is they just check out. Right, I'm like a check-in type of person. Like, I know the goal that I'm trying to get to. I will be very honest with you and tell you I'm not trying to be your best student in class. However, when we get out of this classroom, my goal is to be the, your best student that ever came through this classroom. So, with that understanding, like, what do I need to do? Not what do I, well, not what do we want to do? What do we desire to do? But like, what is necessary? Um, and just understanding the literal. So I would literally get a syllabus, look at like they tell you, all right, 10% participation. Da, 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 da. And I would find the formula. Like, what is the formula that allows? So it's like, all right, this class, I can miss four of these classes, and then that wouldn't, you know, dock my grade only this much. All right, if I, you know, I would just figure out the formula um, because that was my goal, right? I knew that my goal is to graduate. There are other people, like, I say, like, yo, if you want to be a doctor, I don't want my doctor. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want them to, for that to have been their ideology. Like, I don't want that, you know? But like, that's not my thing, you know? Like, my lawyer, I want you to be in the top 10% of your class. Um, and so, I think it's like different strokes for different folks, you know? And, and for me, I had to figure out what that thing is for me. So I would just advise for you guys, like, figure out what that means for you. Like, what is the actual goal that you want? And then what, what does success look like for the, the people that are the, the gatekeepers for the next phase of life that you're trying to get into, right? So I knew for me the next phase is I'm trying to get in tech stars, I'm trying to get into whatever. Like, tech stars will literally tell people drop out of school if you get into tech stars, because you're in tech stars now. Like, why are you still in college? Um, and like, seriously, I've, I have friends that have had those conversations, and so, for me, uh, yeah, just fi figure out the formula of like where it is that you're actually trying to go and then what does success look like in that context. And then I would say relentlessly pursue that and graduate if that's in your <laughs> desire. So that was my desire. Yeah, I would, uh, I would say ask for, ask for advice, ask for help from people. I feel like we all, I mean, at least me, I didn't realize how many opportunities uh, there really was here at Newhouse, especially for entrepreneurs. Um, I kind of, at least last year, I was like, you know, I, I have the same mindset of like, all right, I'm just gonna like do the bare minimum and like try to build my business as much as I can on my own. And what I didn't realize is there's actually so much help here. Yeah. Um, I started like just send, sending emails, reaching out to people. Um, like you said, have something prepared so like you're not like just like, oh, I haven't, like actually have something to give them. And then, like, doors just open up. Uh, like you mentioned, um, what was it? Uh, the, the, the brand? No, 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 uh, the Launchpad, Launchpad. Yes. So, like, I, I had no idea that there was actually, like, competitions that give students money for their, uh, for their entrepreneurial, like, startups. Mm -hmm. um, and just meeting with the, the Dean of Whitman, he, like, put us on, like, three competitions. Dean Eugene! <laughs> So it was like, wow, like that can really just make it like $25,000 yeah. is a lot of money. Like it, it can really change a lot. So reach out to people, ask for advice, ask for help, and you'll be surprised. Absolutely. And you're going to, your own, everyone's journey here is going to look completely different. Clearly you can tell the re using of the resources. Um, before we go to questions, so make sure you're getting those ready. I did want to ask you because I'm sure being an entrepreneur and being in that space, you've also had interactions and with people who maybe are just talking the talk and not walking the walk. And I want, would like to know what's one piece of advice you would give to someone who's actually wanting to do something in this space. I feel like sometimes we hear so much empty advice, but for someone who's really into this, what would you tell them? <laughs> we see through you. That's what I would say. That's what I was waiting for. Like, it's like, okay, I don't know, I don't know how to say it. Like, like uh, it's like, man, 
you know, like you, I, hopefully you guys have some level of like consciousness and awareness. Like you kind of know if someone's lying to you or like, you know if like someone's like BSing you and it's like, all right, bro, like get on my face, bro. I'm trying to buy a drink right now. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know when somebody's like, all right, bro, like what, what do you want? What, like, what do you really want? Um, and so it's like, man, like, it's like, you know, come with that spirit, like to what you said about like, hey, like if, if you really are about that life, if you really have an idea and about that life means a lot of different things. Like, let's just start like, hey, I have an idea. It's like, well, what are you doing to like show for that, right? So it's like, uh, I have creators literally like come to my house, call me every single day, like anywhere from, oh, they have hundreds of thousands of followers, so, like they're just getting started and like, they'll call me, they'll be like, yo, Kelsey, like, I know what you'd be talking about and I just wanna say I'm ready, like I'm ready to go, I'm just ready. And I'm like, what are you even saying right now? Like, like what are you talking about? Like, okay, like what specifically do you want or do you need or are you interested in or you wanna build? Like, what's the thing? Um, but I think a lot of people just feel like, you know, they have to clean themselves up. You know, it's the idea of you gotta clean yourself up before you go to God, that like, type of idea. And it's like, man, like, as an entrepreneur, it's not like that. You actually need to just like start and get something out that people can experience as fast as possible. They're probably gonna hate it. Like, they're gonna be like, yo, this is trash. And you, you have to be honest and be like, you know what, it might, it might be, it might not be, but let me ask more people. Let me give it to more people. And then it's like, if you talk to 10 people and nine of them was like, yo, this is trash, like, <laughs> That's data. Like, who's to say if it's right or wrong? But it's data, and so you should use data, have that linear story, and then like, you know. So um, there's room for everybody. Um, I would say like the tech space, especially once you get into like venture capital, all that. Like, it's a different world. It's a different game. Um, so just understand that the entrepreneurial life is is a good life. It's fun life, but it's also it has it has whatever systematic issues that you feel like you're dealing with in your life. Get into tech and entrepreneurship, and it'll 10x. Um, basically, in terms of just those like systems uh, that are like set up for or against certain folks, so uh, all of that stuff is real. So just know that you're going to be bumping up against a lot of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's like, what do you want to create today? Um, so that's what I would say. If you want to, if you want to start, start with something, and then bring that something to somebody. Even if it's you know whatever gift you have to bring, like. Um, I'm trying not to do too many biblical references, but like it's the idea of like, man, if all you have is like the ability to like play your harp <laughs> for somebody, like come and like play. Like if 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 what you have to give is ten dollars, like give like and you know just just what is it you know that you can bring in the person? Like I didn't need to get a whole business plan from her to have a conversation, but I do need you to be able to articulate your idea and to, like show me something so that we can start from there. Um, and so that's what I would challenge you guys to do. It's like you don't need to be perfect, but garner whatever it is that you do have to then be able to articulate your vision and make it clear so that then other people can engage and integrate with it. Yeah, I would say um, it, it is really fun to like imagine businesses and to come up with these ideas and I think almost anybody can imagine themselves being an entrepreneur and but once it starts to become hard work a lot of people aren't ready to put that in so if you are like really ready to go all in and like do it just be prepared to make sacrifices. Mm. Um, I think that's what a lot of people like, when they s start, they don't realize like how many sacrifices you actually have to make. With that being said, don't sacrifice like your relationships with people, but definitely like be prepared to like miss out on some fun for more fun, hopefully later <laughs> on. <laughs> that's exactly how it happens. <laughs> um, I think coming into this year, I already knew that I was not going to be having any fun. I would not be going out at all. My weekends are dedicated That's tough. to really yeah, whole year. <laughs> wow. Sacrifice. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, everybody has their formula. Own, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I've already That's had sure I've already had fun. four years of Q's parties. Yeah, 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 I think yeah, I'm, I'm kind of over it at this point. But I've been fortunate enough to know what it feels like to really dedicate yourself to something for a few months at a time. So. A year? I got it. Okay. But what I will say is that you need to stop stopping yourself if you are interested in doing something. That's something I've always had to fight myself on. Any failure, any negative feedback, it was just a stopping point for me. That was it. Oh well. Now I've gotten to a point where I have a vision, and this is another piece of advice, um, lie to yourself a little bit. And when I say, <laughs> yeah. When, when I say lie to yourself, I just mean tell yourself these little lies like, oh yeah, I already have this, basically manifestation or whatever they want to call it now on TikTok. Be, delu <laughs> be delusional. This is that, that, soft, is this is that soft life stuff. <laughs> <laughs> be delusional because it works. I don't know what it was, but before I even started this year, I said, oh, I'm going to have cameras for my show. 
They, those cameras are $9,000 altogether. I don't have $9,000, but I did end up going to another studio and they said, yeah, we'll get you the cameras. Then I said, okay, I have a crew. Now I have a crew. If you just start saying these things to yourself and start believing it, it's gonna happen. And make sure to have those little backup plans in case one thing falls through. Then you have another plan. That falls through, another plan. Just like uh, with the dean's office, when I'm go gonna go meet with him, I'm sure he's gonna tell me he can't offer me a certain amount of money to go, but I have another plan. <laughs> so it's gonna work out. Always make sure you have backup plans, lie to yourself, and stop stopping yourself. I love that. And with that, uh, Wes has a mic. So I would love to hear from y'all your questions. I see a question over there. <laughs> Um, Go hit them stairs, Wes. Yes, if you want to just scream it too, I know you got a voice. No, we'll bring the mic. Oh, sure. yeah. Wes, Wes is coming up with the mic. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, don't make him walk a bottom. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, introduce yourself. Wait, what? Do you introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Sianis. <laughs> um, I'm staff, but I'm also a TRF student. Um, so. I don't know if this is a stupid question, but I'm just gonna There's ask it anyway. So whenever I think about entrepreneurs, I I think about like, so, cause I know that there is a, um, so like how do things like healthcare go into, cause I'm like, so I would, if I were to be an entrepreneur, like a full-time job, like is that even possible? Like can you start? And if so, like how do you start? Because like, how would how do I pay for my? Because I feel like sometimes some people do have like a very supportive family and like you know you can crash at your parents' place and stuff. But other people, you're like, I don't have any savings. I I have a bunch of student loans and credit card loans, and healthcare is also something like very important. So like, how do you kind of get through until like, is there a union or something for entrepreneurs? But yeah, that, that's my question. That's a good Great question. question. Uh, as a recent 26 year old who just started paying my own health insurance. I have a lot to and say there. And bought your own home. Yeah, and who just bought my own home. Yeah, I'm going through it right now. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, man, so I would say, one thing I would say first uh, is take care of yourself before you take care of others. You gotta put on your life jacket before you put on other people's life jacket. Now, what take care of yourself looks different for everyone in terms of what do I need in order to live, right? Um, financially, socially, spiritually, economically, mentally, emotionally, whatever, right? Um, and so first, what I would say is like a lot of people are like, oh, like I'll just quit my job and start an idea. I think that first, like let's say like if you're someone who already has a job, I would definitely recommend starting your business on the side and getting to a point where like you're at least like 75% of the way of matching what it is that you're already making and your job before you actually make that transition. Um, that just gives you that cushion uh, to, to where it's like, okay, I'm already, I've already kind of hit those highs, lows in terms of that entrepreneurial thing where at least I'm now starting to track towards seeing some level of predictable, repeatable revenue that is uh, sustaining a lifestyle that's at least, uh, you know, 75% of the way of where you already are. That's what I would say if you already have a job. Um, I would say try to, to my knowledge, there's not, there's like different programs that exist. There's not like officially like an entrepreneurial union, um, <laughs> even though that'd be awesome. Uh, but you know, for me, I, I started like as a freelancer. So, uh, you know, it was originally, okay, let me, let me, and before I create a business, let me make sure that I myself can do the thing to make money. So like I was a creator making money as a videographer, right? First. And then as a director. Um, and then I was still operating though as a videographer and a director when I first started collective. So I was directing on projects up until, uh, like even when I was living in LA, literally through Techstars, after Techstars, um, probably through like 2021, it wouldn't be a lot of shoots. It'd be like, oh, at and is like, yo, can you direct this commercial? I'm like, for sure. Um, but then that's like $10,000 in a day, two days. Um, and so then it's like, cool, that's taking care of expenses for, you know, maybe two months, like whatever in LA. And so um, it's really about like, you know, I didn't necessarily need a full-time job, uh, you know, I had a little bit of money from Techstars, um, but then being able to bring in that like cash as a freelancer still allowed me to operate as an entrepreneur at that first stage. Then uh, continued to, to keep growing. Once I got like Forbes, like all that, I was like, okay, I actually think that I have like, and having a master's in entrepreneurship, um, I was like, okay, I can kind of like start consulting and taking the knowledge that I have and starting like helping other entrepreneurs, helping businesses who want to be more creative or innovative. And so then I started consulting and I still do consulting stuff now. 
um, I make way more money outside of collective than I make from collective, um, just from doing speaking events or um, I, I do a lot of stuff with, with AT&T and like different brands where it's like, I'm just able to operate kind of as a spokesperson and like use my likeness and my brain literally to help people uh, through like consulting. And so that still allows me to be an entrepreneur of a startup buy a house and then even making a decision to like move to Tulsa, mm -hmm. right? Like I live on Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma on Greenwood Avenue. Uh, and I was able to buy a house for like 250K, three bedroom, two bath. My mortgage basically cost me my rent dude in LA. And uh, in a couple of years, you'll realize how great that is. Um, and There's so no for, hoops for, yeah. for that, but trust me, it's <laughs> yeah, really good. It's really good. Uh, and, but for me, it was like, yo, I had to make the decision to not live in LA. Mm -hmm. I had to make like certain sacrifices that are like, yo, like, what is it that I actually want to garner for my life? Um, but now I live in Tulsa, I could buy a house. Now I could, I'm investing in other companies. Like I have more income to do other things. So I would just say like, it's not a one fit model. It's like, stagger it in a way that allows you to get what you need at that stage mm -hmm. specifically um try to hit a next milestone at that stage and then make a decision to like kind of fall back on something else but i would say um in my own experiences i, I think that like if i if i wasn't at syracuse i don't know if i would have um I, I had the privilege and the luxury of the free i had i had posse but also like my parents were paying for the rest of my school and um, you know, I could just go home. I knew if everything failed, I can go home and my mom will make me food and allow me to sleep for free, right? Um, and so there's also a certain privilege that I had in that to be able to just like try really, really hard. Worst case scenario, I'll go get a job, maybe where my dad works or like something like that, right? So um, I definitely think that that's valid. But yeah, just try to, don't try to feel like you have to do everything at once. Just figure out how can I be creating value, getting in money for myself, even if it's not even coming in through my business, just how can I create income outside of this W-2 job so that I don't have to rely on the W-2 job for my state of living overall. Great question, okay. absolutely. Next question. Hello, my name is Ryan Kongyu. Thank you so much for this and for this moment. I really do appreciate you coming out and for the panelists having all those statements made and all the inspiration you've given. A lot of gratitude for that. I am a communication rhetorical studies major. We're actually in, uh, for CRS, we're in a different building and I always talk about how Professor Phillips remarks on that other house, our brothers and sisters at the other house. Um, my question to you is about particularly the media and entertainment industry. Today, we have a lot of people coming out doing podcasts, using social media platforms to create their portfolio. Anyone, any one of you who could answer this, how would you advise for us to distinguish ourselves from the multitudes of people who are using the various social media platforms to create portfolios? Create a collective portfolio. Everyone pull out your phone right now. The way that you spell collective is up there, up there. <laughs> First sentence. So just Google it. You can go create a free portfolio. Feel free to DM me on LinkedIn if you have any questions, and I'd love to figure out how to get you set up, and then I'll let them say the rest. <laughs> um, as someone who, like I said, was a marketing major for four years, a lot of it is about branding, and I know a lot of people here like hate to hear that it's about branding and how you market yourself, but that is a very, very big aspect of it because that's how you can differentiate, differentiate to yourself from the competition, essentially. But you also need to make sure that when you're doing this, you have a human aspect to you because what I've noticed is that a lot of creators now, and it's not necessarily a bad thing because it is a way to make money, but they come off as so money-driven that they become distant from the people they're trying to connect with. Yep. So you need to make sure that you do have that human aspect. You are, you know, in real time responding to people. It's called social listening, when you are actually monitoring people who respond to your content and you can respond to them in real time. Um, it's, it's something that makes them sticky consumers, that's what we call them, where they keep coming back to your content and they get excited to engage with it because they're expecting, you know, maybe something from you. That is if you are doing that kind of content creation. So that's what I would advise. Yeah, I'd agree. Uh, definitely be yourself at, at its core. Be, be weird, be different, but um, don't be too different in the sense that like you'll stand out, but you aren't gonna be able to um, 
actually garner like the, the audience that you're looking for. So what I'd say is look at concepts. Look at proving concepts that work on in, in, in the creator space. Um, and then look at what hasn't been done with it yet and what, it, what you can do to make it unique and make it uh, individual to you. But I would say definitely looking at overall concepts, you can already give yourself a huge head start of like how you can create um, successful content. Yeah, and I'll add to that too because prior to being here, I've worked for 10 years both with creators and brands on the storytelling front. And I think echoing what Kelsey was saying earlier, it's very clear to see those who are inauthentic, and I know authenticity mm -hmm. is, a, is a buzzword, but Every, at least in my career, and I know in a lot of other people's, every job that I've gotten is never because of the job that I currently have, but always because of the thing I'm doing outside of it. So whether, you know, I was at a, a private equity firm, but I was also where I still am, the senior director of alternative programming at Prodigy Media, that's the thing that allowed me to connect, um, you know, and be here at Newhouse. So I would just say leverage what you're most interested in, what your passions are. Every one of my students knows I'm a super huge fan of motorsports. So I pursued something there where I was able to use my skills to engage in that. And that's how you end up building the future that you want for yourself. Not what you, you know, what the other person's doing, right? You can look at everyone's portfolios and try to compare yourself. But it's really what are you most passionate about and what can you bring in? What makes you the linchpin, whether in your own organization or in someone else's? And that's the key thing you have to communicate. Yeah. However, whether you know, do it on collective. Yeah, and then you're, and then you're, 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 you understand how to create a decision matrix for you of what's a good opportunity. Mm. Like me and my partner, I joke all the time. Like people present me opportunities every day, mm -hmm. and it's funny to me to examine how much do they know me based on what opportunity mm -hmm. they present to me because it tells me the knowledge that you have. Like, do I think this is a good? Do I think this is a good opportunity or or like for Kelsey? It's often rooted in like, well, what is your understanding and knowledge of me? Right, um, so like I can say like, yo, I have this awesome shirt for you, and you're like, I hate that shirt. Like it's like, no, but it's for you. It's like, well, what reference points are you using to like say it's for me? Like maybe we have a different mm -hmm. decision matrix of like what good means for me, and so you have to create that for yourself based on how you build your portfolio. So that if a brand is sending you an opportunity or if somebody's recommending you, it's because based on what it is that I'm seeing, like I can very clearly see what good opportunity means for you. And so even with our portfolios, we allow creators to very clearly articulate not just their skills and their projects, but their interests. Um, we'll work with brands like we're signing on right now an NBA team, or we've worked with a golf brand where they're like, hey, I need a video editor, but I need them to have some level of interest or experience in golf because I can't teach them what a par is or a birdie when they're creating this content. I just need them to already have that domain exp ex expertise. Mm -hmm. But if for whatever reason you felt like you didn't want to bring that forward into your resume or whatever, maybe now you're not unique when an opportunity actually could have been more aligned if you were like authentic about who you are. Um, yeah. And I'll add one more thing to that as well. When we're thinking about portfolios, definitely do it on collective, but when we're thinking about leveraging things like social media, it can feel like we have to follow a very distinct structure of what we learned how to use LinkedIn for and do a long piece. It's not about that, it's about making authentic connections. There's people in the industry who are passionate, whether they are part of the new house family or they're a part of you know a separate thing. Everyone's ex if you're excited about what they're doing, they're going to be excited too if you bring something to the table. So be authentic, be open and interested. If you're interested in golf, if you're interested in Formula One, if you're interested in whatever music is your passion, communicate that. Because that's how people will find you mm -hmm. and how you'll find your next opportunity. Mm -hmm. Other questions? We have some down here too, Wes. When, she's, when you're ready yet. Hey. Hi, um, my name is Mylon Hawkins. I am now a current grad student here for television, radio, and film. Very excited. Again, thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your day to come and just speak your wisdom. You guys are all dynamic and amazing. Um, I don't know, I'm just very interested, I guess, in how people operate on an everyday basis. And you guys all talked very heavily about your motivations as well as inspirations behind everything you do. So I guess like I wanted to ask who or what or whatever the driving force is that keeps you accountable each and every day. My partner's sitting right here. Babe, if you want to stand. <laughs> yes, please If you want to stand, please. Let's all clap for her. <laughs> okay, so like, man, like, it's like ever since I met Elle, it's like that was a piece that I needed to like, I eat better, you know, it's like, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm vegan now, I have a routine relatively, like it's like I, my lifestyle is actually sustainable. Um, I'm into like agriculture and like gardens and like just, just a level of grounding that actually allows me to participate in all of this stuff. Um, life is crazy for me often on a week to week, but on a day to day, I try to find vacation through the day. Um, I very much so don't want a life where Everything feels like work. Um, 
you know, and I love work, but like it should feel like passion play. Uh, and so, you know, for me, it's like, how can I create a lifestyle so that uh, even like collective is not the most exciting thing that I've done on a day to day is like how I try to build my life. So whether it's like, you know, ever since I've been vegan, even like I've, I've become a foodie, like I, I want to understand like, oh, like where did, where did this meal come from? Like, oh, like where did they grow these mushrooms? And like, it's just a deeper connectivity to life that I think that I have that just makes me more appreciative and it makes me feel like I'm actually a part of something that's bigger than myself. Um, and that's been very grounding and it also opens my brain up. So it's like in an interesting way, it grounds me while also expands me at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, that's one thing I would say. It's just like finding, it, it, it's just finding the like-minded energy that is actually driving you towards your goals. But that, that thing may look different. Like I never knew that that thing would be agriculture and that it, like, you know, like, oh, health and all this stuff. But interestingly enough, like it paired so well with the things that I was already thinking about and why I moved to Greenwood and why I moved to Black Wall Street all had to do with this idea of economic sustainability and community and togetherness. And then I'm like, oh wow, plants and trees and nature is already doing that whole thing. Like, um, and so just being able to find areas that may not be your main do domain expertise, um, but just, just going near where it feels good and that gives you deeper grounding while also things that expand. And that could be friend groups, um, that could be where you choose to go to school. Um, but I would just say draw yourself near to what grounds you and what expands you. I'm going to have to agree with that. I had the same question for myself this very morning when I was getting ready. I was like, I've never been so passionate about something for so long. So, so long. Um, and when I say that, I mean a project I've been working on. And I think it's because, going back to what I said, I started lying to myself. I started saying that this was gonna happen, and not only that, I told other people those lies too, those tiny itty bitty lies. And when I say lies, I don't mean far out, just things that I expected to happen the next day, that I would hope would happen. And I started telling them to Kelsey, and then I started telling them to Sean, and then people at Launchpad, and then it was like, I, I gotta do this now. I really gotta do this. And because of that, they started connecting me with people who are just as excited about my idea as I am. And it started to become fun for me. So it's become the highlight of my day. Love, love classes, classes are great. New house is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But when I get to leave and I get to go to the launch pad and sit down and talk to people who are just so excited and I meet with my team of software developers and you know, they're so excited to talk about my idea and everything and all the things we can possibly do and the branding and how we can make it look and who we're gonna connect with. It just gets me so excited and it makes it easy to stay motivated. And I think that when you have fun with what you're doing, it stays so much easier to just be inspired and you know stay motivated and keep going at it every single day. Yeah. Uh, what what helps me stay motivated is definitely surrounding myself with uh, similar energy. Building a team, build a team of people that you're excited to be around. Um, I know there's a lot of times, and like I'm human, we're all human. Like we have self doubts. We we say like, oh, is this really gonna work? Like, oh, what am I doing? And then I just remind myself that like I have people that are like that are, are, are expecting something from me too. Like I, my business partner Thomas couldn't do it without him. Like any time that I have a little bit of self doubt, I'm like got to do it for him. And he does the same thing. Anytime he has a little bit of self doubt, he's like Nick's counting on me. It's kind of like having like a gym buddy, having somebody that like you can lean on in those weaker times helps a lot. Yeah. I'll just add community, so it's echoing a lot of what everyone has shared, but having community, whether it's in person or um, <coughs> online, is super helpful because it reminds you of who you really are. Sometimes you can forget in the middle of the hardest time of your career or when you're juggling a lot, and it's nice to come back to it, right? So definitely community. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Van Norris. Um, I am on staff as well as a producer. Um, I'm also in the TRF grad program. Um, just want to say appreciate y'all, first of all, for being here. Um, I guess my main question is, I also appreciated your heart reference. Um, my mom used to tell me that a lot. Um, I'm someone who's very big on, uh, like, just knowing your role sometimes. And, like, the director doesn't have to, like, try to be the producer. The producer don't try to get, like, just doing what you're good at. Um, I guess thinking of your own creative spaces, how 
did you all navigate um, within where you want to be long term? Going from like the beginning and just being able to hone in what you were doing at that point in time and having a big picture in mind later on, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I was originally uh, supposed to go to Florida State, play basketball. And long story short, like God told me, no, don't do that. That's not the plan. And I was like, all right, bruh, so what is about to happen? Uh, and so for me, it wasn't until later. So that was one of the instances that happened. Another, in terms of transition, another transition then that happened was I went from being like a director to like a founder, right? I didn't realize until being a founder that being a high performing D1 recruit and being a director and being a startup founder are very similar vantage points. Um, if there's two minutes left, we're down by four, the ball's in my hands. I see the floor, I see the defense. I understand what's happening, what's been happening historically all game, like who's hot, who's not, like all these things have to go through your mind and you have to facilitate. And you have to say, okay, who's gonna have the ball? Where do we need to pass it to? What's happening? Like you're thinking through all these things and you're, you're facilitating. Uh, as a director, it was the same way. I love walking into set and having like, let's say call, a call sheet of like 30 people is like my favorite scale size where it's like, a classroom of like, all right, y'all, like, what's up? Like, how's everybody feeling? Like, even coming in, like, 110, where we at? Like, and checking in with everybody, like, all right, who's my P P PA? Like, all right, who's AD? Like, checking in and like to everyone's roles. And like, I really do believe it's like, man, if you're AD, like, you know, AD, like, you, you should be able to know, like, okay, no, nah, like, you're definitely a line producer. Or like, yeah, no, nah, like, you're definitely a director. Or like, no, nah, you're definitely a PA. Cause the way your spirit shows up to that thing, me, like, you know, you're in the pocket, right? Like, you know that you're playing your role well. Um, and so, yeah, I had to realize that, like, oh, there's a lot of transversible skill, transferable skills. Uh, you know, from again, like being a, being a director and then going to the startup founder where it's like, all right, every day I'm looking at the markets, how much money do we have in the bank? What's our runway? Uh, you know, we, oh, we need to go get investors. Oh, we need to get team. Oh, somebody want to quit. Oh, somebody got an attitude in the meeting today. <laughs> like, oh, like just random things that are always happening and, and to say, okay, like it is my job to direct. It's not my job to do everything. It's not my job to, it's literally my job to come in, understand what's happening around me and to make sure that we tell a great freaking story, right? Um, and if we need to, we can go in a post and like, you know, make it a little bit better. Like if it didn't, if, if, if while on set, we did not accomplish everything it is that we need to accomplish, there's still a way to still come back on top and like, you know, integrate the things that we need to into that. So I would just say learn less so about figure out like, oh, who am I gonna be for the rest of my life? Like, it's more so like, what do I know I'm actually kind of good at that I know that I enjoy, and but what's the actual thing, right? So it's like, I know that I'm a director, I know I enjoy being a director, but what's, what, why do I enjoy it? Like, what is it about directing specifically that I enjoy? And then based on those things, are there other areas in my life that I'm also doing those things that I don't even consciously recognize that I'm also showing up the way I'm showing up as a director, I'm showing up that way here. Um, and continue to, 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 to kind of like get that data. Um, and it exists as metadata around you, like it may not feel super hyper-conscious, but the more that you then recognize that it's, it's, it's real data, and then you could use that to make all your future decisions of like, do I wanna do this, do I wanna do that? It's like, you already know how you feel in that type of environment, even though you've never been there before, because you know how to kind of take other skills and kind of predictably be like, oh, how would I be in this environment? How would I be in this environment? Um, so I would say try to pay attention to those types of things more so than the thing that you're doing yourself. Or say, hey, you know what? I, I don't wanna be a, uh, like I knew I didn't wanna be a DP. For example, I was a videographer and I was like, all right, I definitely need to transition to be a director and not a DP. Because being a DP was way too technical for me. Like, I was like, yo, I'm, I'm not actually interested at a certain level of like, like, I don't freaking care about every little thing in the camera. Like, I don't even want to know. I don't want to know. Um, and so I had to learn, like, oh, well, I'm not that analytical. But some people may think, oh, no, but a DP, that's super creative. But, like, I saw it as, like, a very technical still role. So I would say try to examine not just, like, the role that you have, but, like, the why of, like, why you like it or what it is that makes you tick. And then try to find those types of roles in a lot of different things. And you should test that out. Maybe we have one more question. Okay, this is so great. I love you guys, you are great. I mean, I'm just listening to you. I've got four kids, three of them graduated from Syracuse University, two are out in LA doing what you're doing, making their own way. They ain't calling me for money, they making it out there. But I wanna ask you guys something. 
In 2011, YouTube came on the scene. The conversation about what's happening, we were talking 10 years from now, ago, it wouldn't even be a conversation. So what I'm saying to you, and that is an avenue now for a lot of people, what do you guys see the next thing is gonna change the landscape for creators and storytellers? AI. AI? AI, for sure. Yeah, and I'll add to that too. I think, um, I'm, I'm currently working on it, but I think the idea of studios as the end all be all of you know, creating media and content, that's no longer a thing. Um, it's really gonna be about the, we've been talking about creator economy, but it's gonna be a real thing. It's gonna be a thing that has legs. In the past, we used to say if an actor only had um, small studio experience, it wasn't good enough. But given the fact that right now we're dealing with strikes where if we're comparing it to baseball terms, uh, people are no longer playing in the, minor in the major leagues because the minor leagues have better benefits. Um, it's going to be about those minor leagues stepping up and really telling new stories, giving new opportunities, and changing what we know as media. Everything from what we're creating, who's creating it, who's leading it, who are the gatekeepers, right? Because that's why I came to Newhouse. I was like, who's making the decisions and why? Um, and how can I be one of them? And now I get to do that, right? Because that's what alternative programming, everything from Twitch to TikTok to whatever new medium is going to be around over the next decade, that's going to be the new conversation, the cementation, the, the really the concretization of that. I don't really have anything to add just because I feel like what I've been hearing so often is AI, AI, AI. And of course now independent creators are up and coming more than they were ever before. And I, I, like you were saying, I don't really think that studios are going to have as much power as they've been having or agencies, for example, are going to have as much power. Um, a lot of agencies use independent creators and I've seen it for myself. I've been the one to you know hire those freelancers. So. Yeah. Most of our customers are agencies. Yeah. yeah. So it's just it's gonna change the game for sure. Yeah. For I sure. used to our first slide deck of like our pitch deck was the traditional agency model was broken. <laughs> <laughs> like that was like our whole model. And I think even to the AI point, like it's 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 it, it exists in everything. Like whether that's like oh using generative AI to like uh, influence the way you use Photoshop. To where now it's not just a matter of technically understanding how to use Photoshop, but understanding how to prompt. And, and it's like vision casting. It's saying, hey, the technology exists to take my words and then to like take those words and to achieve technical functions based on the words that I'm prompting it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we need to understand words better. We need to understand actions better. It's almost like, what was that grammar class that everyone hates? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Calm 101. Michael, what is it? Calm. Oh, that one. Calm 101. 101? Yeah. yeah. With the I clicker? hated it. I got a D in that class. <laughs> um, that class was very hard for me. It was like learning English, but like in a different language. Like it was, yeah, it was like learning English again. Uh, and with the idea of like really being able to break down words mm -hmm. and really understand, okay, if I'm saying, hey, create this in the style of this, or saying, hey, create this in the likeness of this, that means different things mm -hmm. kind of to the technology, right? So I think us being able to really understand as creators, not just how to, how to create the thing, but how to prompt tools mm -hmm. to create the thing. Um, and so I think that's what it is like with AI for me that I love. It's, it allows us to take this whole entrepreneurial creative mindset that we talked about, um, and literally maybe not even have to have the technological tools to build it. It's way easier to build software these days, um, the same way it's way easier to make a video these days. So I think that the level of playing field goes up then for the storytellers and for the creators to have great ideas, great visions, and then to be able to know how to vision cast and articulate that to the technology or to the people so that then they can create the thing. And I'd, I'd like to add with a specific example. One of the shows currently on my slate is using generative AI to tell the story about carding races in over 40 plus languages. So another thing that my students who are here and those in the class, um, they know that I've been saying, this is about a global market. This is no yes. longer about what's happening in the yeah. US. And I feel like Newhouse has always had a lens of what's happening in the US, but it's a global market. You are not just competing, but you're collaborating internationally. You're making content in 40 plus languages at the drop of a hat with the tools that are available now. Imagine in 10 years what AI yeah. is going to be, so. And those companies also, what I'll say too, are like primarily domestic, like US companies originally. Mm -hmm. YouTube, TikTok, or not TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch. like yeah, Twitch. You think about those like early creator economy companies. A lot of that is starting to change. Mm -hmm. You look at the companies now that are really starting to take off. Uh, yeah, like we're we're getting global, but also what's great is like our distribution mm -hmm. is is way more grander. A big reason why we moved to Tulsa with Collective is because market share. Like think about what we can do taking over the market of middle America, right? Mm -hmm. Like in the in the midst of this creator economy boom, mm -hmm. it's like then we want to go to Africa, right? Like yeah. then we want to go to like. South America, it's like we're literally trying to uh, 
yeah, like there are creators everywhere, but all these markets are untapped. And so now for us, it's like, all right, like how do we raise the flag and say, hey, at least, hey, everybody create a portfolio. And then once everybody has a portfolio, then now we've built this global workforce. Now we have their updated data in terms of what they're working on, what they're skilled at, what they're interested in. And then now all these brands all across the world can tap into this global workforce of millions of creators. Um, it's kind of our North Star. Cool. We gotta talk. All yeah, right. let's, hey, let's talk. Okay. All right, well, <laughs> we wanna thank our panel here for, for coming today. So thank you to uh, Professor Martinez for leading the panel. And then of course, uh, Nick, Kelsey, uh, and, and, oh geez, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay, Wes, it's okay. I'll be in your office. Tomorrow. I know, I know, I know. Uh, yeah, Clark, thank you so for, for coming. So, but yeah, thank you all uh, also for coming as well. I know some folks have some questions. Um, I will say there's another group that's coming in right after, so that's why we have a hard stop at five o'clock. But we're not done yet. Um, actually, right upstairs uh, in food.com, off of food.com, which is called Legal Seafood, we got some uh, some snacks here, also some coffee and some juice uh, and some uh, cookies as well for you all to kind of collaborate and, and, and chat also with our, our members who came with us today. So if you had any questions, you can get those answered. I do want to give a couple shout outs to some folks that's also here. Um, we've got Shauna Lawrence uh, from our Career Development Center that's here. So I know you heard all about these creators and positions and looking for internships. Um, Shauna's got some information uh, for you all. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Raquel Brown Burton that's here, our Associate Dean for what we call IDEA, Inclusivity, Diversity, Equity, Accessibility. Also Professor Michael Schoonmaker uh, from our, our Department Chair for Television, Radio, and Film uh, as well. And then we also want to thank uh, Vince Cobb who's uh, on the cameras here. Uh, also, Vince works at the Cage, so if you all are uh, with equipment and things that you are looking to do for your projects, talk to, to Vince. Uh, and then last.